basically, there is a giant probe that comes from outer space. UFOs and their probes. Hey everybody, welcome to this Trek-tastic episode of Super Sci-Fi Party, the only podcast where we talk exclusively about fun science fiction movies, TV shows, and more. No post-apocalyptic downer sci-fi allowed. My name is Todd Kinsley, and with me as always is my phaser-wielding, whale-stealing, temporal shielding co-host and brother Scott Kinsley. How are you doing on Earth in 1986, Scott? Ooh, 1986, uh... Probably watching Star Trek The Next Generation, actually. Or no, that was 87, wasn't it? Excellent. Today we're talking about the movie Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Star Trek IV debuted in theaters on November 26th, 1986. Scott, what was competing with Star Trek IV on its opening weekend back in 1986? Oh, there was something called The Wraith, King Kong Lives, An American Tale... And the big easy. King Kong lives. King Kong lives. I don't recall that one. It's one where they actually find King Kong a bride. Bride of King Kong. Yep, I believe there was a blood transfusion because he was getting a fake heart put in. That sounds vaguely familiar. It's a strangely complex storyline for King Kong. Well, I'm definitely excited about today's movie because you and I are both old school and uh, semi-new school Star Trek fans up to a point. Yep. I'm willing to say Trekkie, even though it became out of vogue in the 80s when Next Generation came around and everyone's like, I'm a Trekker. Trekker. Like, Whatever. Trekkie, Trekker, all the same. All the same. You like Star Trek? That's awesome. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home is one of the original Star Trek big screen movies. So there was Star Trek, the original series, and then they took those characters and spun them off into a series of big screen movies. And this, of course, was movie number four, The Voyage Home. Did you like The Voyage Home, Scott? The Voyage Home is definitely in my uh, top ten list of Star Trek movies. Actually, probably top two or three. But To me, this is the best Star Trek movie that stars the original characters, with the exception of Wrath of Khan. <laughs> Wrath of Khan was good. In fact, if I was going to give advice to someone who wanted to get into the Star Trek big screen movies with the original cast, I would say start with Wrath of Khan and then skip to Star Trek for The Voyage Home. Yeah, there's some recommended list out there that suggests uh, with the original cast, you go with the even number of movies. Uh, oh, that's right. I remember hearing that. And it, it holds up pretty well. Yeah. I would definitely skip part one. <laughs> Was it just Star Trek the movie? Star Trek the motion picture. The motion picture. See, the big difference between uh, movies now and movies then, well, there are several differences, but... One of the largest differences when it came to sci-fi is back in the 80s, you could not just computer generate everything. So if you wanted a monster or an alien landscape or you wanted someone to float or whatever it was, you had to find different practical ways to do most of the effects. Uh, Computerized effects were just in their infancy and they weren't really up to the task. So a big part of Star Trek 1 which I believe was 1981, maybe? Sounds right. 79, 81, somewhere in there. Um, A big part of it was they did this, I believe it's a model of the Starship Enterprise, and it looked really good floating in space dock, and then they just, they would take endless shots of where they're basically saying, look at our great special effects. And everyone inside the thing flying around it would just like, oh, (laughs) <laughs> this was parodied on the cartoon show uh, Star Trek Lower Decks. Star Trek Lower Decks. They did a little uh, homage. <laughs> homage. They did a little homage to just flying around the ship, around and around and around, and everyone looking like, ooh, ah. To me, that was Star Trek 1. It was two hours of, ooh, 
Ah, look at our special effects <laughs> as we slowly pan around them in, with shimmery lights. Ooh, special effects. Ah, the parody was beautiful. And we just watched that one, which is why it's very front in our minds. There. We just did. Um, it's not that way anymore with movies. Um, pretty much any movie can do almost anything in terms of special effects, or so it seems, thanks to CGI. But back in the day, it was a big deal. But fortunately, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home doesn't get caught up in that too much. Ooh, look at our special effects isn't really the point of the film, wouldn't you say? Yep, I would agree. And actually, I think that helped them get this movie done quicker. I was looking at some of the IMDb stuff and the timeline on this. They started filming in February of 86, wrapped up filming in May, and then had it out in November. Wow. Although there are reasons for that that we'll get into. Um, It is a time-traveling saga, so I think that helped a lot because it filmed um, partially in the 23rd century, and then it went to the good old 20th century which, of course, is the century that was happening when the movie was actually filmed. Anyway, the tagline for Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, was they traveled back where 23rd century man had never gone before, to a mad, crazy, outrageous time, 1986. (laughs) Star Trek IV was written by Leonard Nimoy and Harvey Bennett, And it was directed by Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy, of course, was an actor from Star Trek, the original series, and he played Spock, who was an alien crew member, which was a big deal at the time. What? Alien? Alien serving aboard an Earth vessel. No way. Of course, now it's quite completely standard, but um, it's because they all stole it from Star Trek. The cast of Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, include William Shatner as Admiral James T. Kirk, Leonard Nimoy as Buck, DeForest Kelly as Dr. Leonard McCoy, James Dewan as Montgomery Scott, George Takei as helmsman Hiroku Sulu, Walter Keoning as Commander Pavel Chekhov, Nichelle Nichols as Ohura, and Catherine Hicks as Dr. Gillian Taylor. So did you know that her role, she plays the, uh, I guess you'd call her a whale doctor? Yeah. Who works at the, um, is it a zoo? Is it an aquarium? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. Is it a whale she sanctuary? Whatever it is. The, the marine biologist. They were doing research on them. Did you know that her role was originally written for Eddie Murphy? <laughs> who was going to be an astrophysicist at Berkeley. Well, that makes sense. That translates to Whale Doctor. Catherine Hicks is probably best known for being the mother on a TV show from the 90s called Seventh Heaven. She's also had a few other roles here and there throughout time. But I think that's probably what she's best known for is the mom on Seventh Heaven. Yeah, I can't picture uh, Eddie Murphy playing her role. That is crazy. That would have been interesting to add Eddie Murphy. Although he does that a lot, doesn't he? (laughs) Well, yeah, he likes to, Eddie Murphy definitely likes to dress up as other people. Well, I mean, he likes to be considered for a role and then not get it. Like Ghostbusters and apparently Star Trek The Voyage Home. And Well, I don't think it's so much that he doesn't get it as he doesn't want it. At that time, I think Eddie Murphy could have any role he wanted. Or he was never approached. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I think a lot of hopeful script writers wrote roles for Eddie Murphy, hoping he would take them, and then he didn't have time because he was so popular. But these days, he would just put on a complete skin suit and play whatever <laughs> role you wanted. <laughs> oh, you want me to play Shaq? Sure. Yeah. I'll get some leg extensions and some, you know. And yeah, who knows how many movies he's actually been in, in one of those suits. Well, there's rumors that he is Tom Cruise, so <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that one. I have not, but I kind of believe it. Why, Eddie? Why? You were so awesome in the 80s when you actually just played roles that were written for or about you or roles for which you seemed like the same human being that would be cast in the role as opposed to at some point he got addicted to playing other people. And I wonder if it all goes back to that Saturday Night Live sketch where they decided to make him look like a white person. 
to go around and see how people reacted to white people. <laughs> it was a spoof, of course. It was set up, but that's the first time I remember seeing him in complete makeup where you couldn't recognize who he was. But I wonder if that's what started it all, is he really liked the reactions he got to that skit, and then he just went off the deep end. It's kind of like people that actually get cosmetic surgery, where you get one and then you can't stop. Michael Jackson? Yeah. That's how I feel about Eddie and the roles where he dresses up as completely other kinds of human beings. But he just went off the rails after that, and anytime he was in a movie, I would ask, does Eddie Murphy play more than three roles? And if the answer was yes, then I would not go see it. I think after The Nutty Professor, that, that's, that was really required in his contract. <laughs> I think it was. But anyway, um, Eddie Murphy was not in Star Trek Four, <laughs> so that's why we talk about it for 10 minutes. Tangent over. But originally, the part of Dr. Gillian Taylor was supposedly written for Eddie Murphy, and he was going to be an astrophysicist. Which I also don't understand what that has to do with whales. (laughs) Clearly the script evolved over time. The plot for Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, is a bit strange, but it's actually fairly simple to relate. Uh, Basically, there is a giant probe that comes from outer space. (laughs) Um, When I say giant, I mean extremely large. UFOs and their probes. I mean, it's supposed to be... How big is that thing supposed to be? Probably... Empire State Building or bigger? Oh, I was going to say size of Michigan. I don't know. It's extremely large. It's just a long, it looks like if you took a 50 gallon metal drum and put it on its side and stretched it way out so it was really <laughs> long, kind of looked like a big metal cigar. Yeah. And then it had kind of like a soccer ball of doom that would come out of the bottom. <laughs> the soccer ball of doom. And it would screech. Anyway, a probe shows up at Earth when uh, the crew of the Enterprise is otherwise disposed, which has to do with the ending of Star Trek 3, which we won't talk a lot about because it was not a good movie. But this probe shows up to Earth, this giant, huge probe, and apparently anything that passes uh, loses power. So once it gets to Earth, it really starts wreaking havoc with Starfleet Command, and it starts affecting the weather. And basically, it's kind of like the apocalypse has come to Earth, right? Yep. And it's making this mechanical screeching sound. And somehow somebody figures out that the mechanical screeching sound is supposed to be a call that's looking for a response. Was that the crew of the Enterprise or someone else? Actually, that was at Starfleet headquarters. They figured that out. They're like, we don't know how to respond to the probe. Starfleet Command somehow figures out that the probe is sending a message and needs a response. I don't know how they figured that out since they don't know what the sounds were or what it meant. But Plot armor. Oh. Plot armor. <laughs> because the script said so. But the giant probe is threatening Earth and the crew of the USS Enterprise, who actually aren't in the Enterprise because it blew up in the last movie, are headed back to Earth to face consequences for things that happened in Star Trek, the movie part three. So when they get close to Earth, Starfleet Command tells them, don't come here. This giant probe is going to kill us all. It's sending a signal. We don't know who it wants to talk to. Just stay away and save yourself. Basically, save yourselves. Which reminds me a little bit of Flash Gordon from the 80s. <laughs> it all comes back to Flash Gordon, doesn't Strap it? Drop yourselves down. So somehow the crew of the Enterprise figures out, good old Ahura figures out that what the probe is looking for is sounds from humpback whales. But unfortunately, in the 23rd century, humpback whales are extinct and had been extinct since the 21st century in this futuristic saga. So that's a problem. (laughs) Yeah, that would definitely be a problem. A giant probe shows up and it's destroying everything and the only way to make it calm down is to have humpback whales talk to it and the humpback whales are extinct what are you gonna do go extinct (laughs) well this is the question posed to the crew of the enterprise and they come up with the idea that they're going back in time do 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 i'm back in time no not gonna join So they're going back in time to the 1950s so they can go to the Under the Sea dance with Marty's mom and, oh, no, wait. They're going back in time to 1986 to find some living humpback whales and bring them to the 23rd century where they can communicate with the probe and stop the probe from destroying Earth. Uh Uh-huh. 
because the earth doesn't want to get probed anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So the, these whales that went extinct are just going to go, oh, yeah, I'll save humanity. Well, I don't know that they're going to be given a lot of choice. I mean, it turns out that they kind of are, but uh, I have a feeling even if they said no, the crew of the Enterprise would have loaded them up anyway. But we're jumping ahead here by quite a lot. So the whole show is basically we take the crew of the Starship Enterprise, who normally has their sci-fi adventures in the 23rd century, and we're taking them to what at the time was the modern day, quote unquote, of 1986, uh, specifically 1986, San Francisco, California, USA. Not a bad plot. No, oh, it sounds fun. I'd go see that. Star Trek had done different episodes uh, where they had traveled through time or gone to places that were very similar to Earth in certain periods of time. So it wasn't completely out of left field for them to do some kind of time travel-esque episode where everyone would be wearing different costumes and it would be a period piece. Um, but of course, this period piece was set in quote unquote modern day or what was modern day when it was shot of <laughs> 1986. Um, I'm guessing that probably reduced the budget of the movie. Yeah, it definitely did. Because you don't have to have wall to wall special effects in every shot like you would if you're shooting something in the 20th century that's supposed to take place in the 23rd century, you need wall-to-wall -wall 23rd century set dressing and costumes and lighting and special effects. Uh, you don't really need that in big parts of Star Trek IV The Voyage Home because they took place in the year that the film was shot. So what do you think of the basic plot of Star Trek IV, Scott? The basic plot was interesting. It was kind of fun because you got to see how your Star Trek characters would interact with modern day people. And that seemed exciting and fun at the time. Actually, it was still fun when we just rewatched it. I think Star Trek 4 is clearly the most fun of all the Star Trek films, in my opinion. You could say that others might be slightly better or whatnot, have some kind of exciting effects or plot line. But as far as just pure fun, I think Star Trek Four is it. What do you think? Definitely. Um, I think this is what they would call a uh, nice movie where there was actually no overarching villain or battle scenes or you know, conflict, really. I mean, there was some conflict because it's a movie. There was uh, a giant probe trying to destroy the Earth. How much conflict do you need? But it didn't have like an evil Klingon captain out to destroy the planet or attacking the crew of the Enterprise at every turn. No, I think pretty much the unspoken plot of the movie is just to take the characters that we're used to seeing in a futuristic sci-fi setting and plop them into quote unquote modern day. I think that was the whole point of the film. And stop wailing. That and stop killing the animals. Yeah. But I think it worked really well. I think there's a lot of comedy in the film um, that you only get in certain episodes of Star Trek, the original series especially. There's a lot of morality plays in Star Trek, the original series. Um, I don't think we have a lot of that in Star Trek for the voyage home, with the exception of the don't kill the whales thing. Famous film critic Roger Ebert wrote, when they finished writing the script for Star Trek IV, they must have had a lot of silly grins on their faces. This is easily the most absurd of the Star Trek stories, and yet, oddly enough, it is also the best, the funniest, and the most enjoyable in simple human terms. I'm relieved that nothing like restraint or common sense stood in their way. <laughs> Exactly like it was some wacky way out concept or something, but it didn't seem that far off to me when I was watching it. Well, you have to put yourself in the shoes of Roger Ebert. He's a serious film critic yeah. who sees a lot of serious films. And then there's a film about a 50 gallon drum with a light up soccer ball coming to attack the earth. And the only way to stop it is for whales to screech at it. So they have to go back in time and run around San Francisco in funny costumes. <laughs> funny costumes, also known as everyday outfits. Uh, and they also um, break what is later called the temporal prime directive, which is basically don't muck around with time. Yeah. Because you might screw things up. 
for example, in order to steal the whales and take them to the 23rd century, they need to build an extra tank into the ship that they have commandeered since the Enterprise got exploded at the end of Star Trek 3. So they go to a manufacturing plant and they just openly mess with the timeline. They show <laughs> the guy at the manufacturing plant how to create transparent aluminum. Ah, that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And one of them even says, oh, should we be messing up the timeline like this? And Scotty goes, ah, how do we know he didn't invent it? And they just leave it at that and move on. Clearly, he did invent it now. (laughs) I'm like, you could destroy the timeline. There's those whole theories about a butterfly flapping its wings in Tokyo would change something in the other side of the world. and The butterfly effect. Different movie. (laughs) Yeah, they just seem to throw all that right out the window in Star Trek IV. See, let's not forget they kidnapped someone from that that time period. Who knows what she would have contributed. They kidnapped two humpback whales and a scientist and take them to the future. And they also tell (laughs) someone about advanced technology at a plant uh, where they can build it. They do all kinds of messing with the timeline. And apparently they just don't care in Star Trek 4. But it's because it's a feel-good movie. No one's really taking it that seriously. The message is about uh, we're killing the planet and the whales. Which really hasn't changed much since 1986. It's only gotten worse. Um, Those are kind of a heavy storyline. But otherwise, everything else in the movie is fairly light and done for fun and comedic effect. Wouldn't you say? Yep. And I think they did it beautifully, too. I mean, the interactions with Kirk and our marine biologist and Spock. That trio just has some awesome dialogue happening there. Well, even when they go back to traveling through time to get back to 1986, um, the scene gets where they're actually doing the time travel gets kind of weird compared to other time travel (laughs) that we've seen in Star Trek. I mean, it looks like traveling through time is like getting high on ecstasy and then running through a sculpture show at a local art gallery. A morphine sculpture show, too. Where the sculptures pop up Mm -hmm. out of the fog. Yeah, that that didn't make any sense to (laughs) me. I don't get it. Especially considering the effects were done by a little company you might have heard of called Industrial Light and Magic. Mm. The people that made Star Wars. Come on. Well, they they did look good. It just made no, it could have been cut out of the movie and I would have been just fine with it. You, know? you immediately know that this is going to be a different kind of Star Trek movie as soon as they get to the quote unquote present, which at the time was 1986. Um, when the captain is leading everyone away from the ship, which they've cloaked in a park so no one can see it. He says, everyone, remember where we parked. Oh. We're like, what? <laughs> Captain Kurt just say, remember where we parked? <laughs> in a park? What? Well, to be fair, we've never had him in charge of a ship that landed on a planet before. <laughs> More or less. I guess shuttlecraft. But yeah. and Then he gets into the street, and one of the big running jokes of the movie is that there's a lot of swearing in 1986 compared to the 23rd century. And they accidentally run in front of a car, and the owner yells, Watch where you're going, dumbass. And Kirk looks at him and goes, Double dumbass on you. <laughs> That's how you knew this was going to be a different kind of Star Trek film. Man, I wonder if that risks the rating. Ooh. <laughs> it might have. You're up to PG 13 now, guys. I might even have to beep that. <laughs> But there's other lines in the movie where they play around with the supposed constant profanity, quote unquote, of 1986. Well, yeah, Spock just outright asks him, he goes, oh, what's up with that? (laughs) He's like, that's just how they talk, man. Little did they know that a couple generations later, it really was going to be nonstop profanity. Indeed. Or maybe we're just getting old. Of course we're getting old. Did you know that William Shatner was 54 years old in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home? Honestly, watching the movie, I wouldn't have guessed he would be 54 at that point. No, he looks pretty good. And I think it's because he got new hair right before this movie. (laughs) And we also know that going back to Star Trek I, the motion picture, the costume designer was tasked to make costumes that held them in where they needed to be held in to make (laughs) the aging cast look good. And this was three movies later. So they had really had it down to a science by then. I need that costume designer for my wardrobe. Every day I would wear it. (laughs) But no, he did look pretty good for 54. And he was jumping and swimming. And he just really still seemed like a sci-fi leading man type. 
even at this point in his career. Yep, he did good. So I decided to look up what happened to the humpback whales Uh-oh. from Star Trek IV. Because <laughs> I was like, I wonder where they ended up. Because I don't know, exactly know the lifespan of a humpback whale, but I kind of expected that they would no longer be with us. But it turns out that they are definitely with us, and they are doing great. Well, they have not changed a day since the movie. <laughs> Because it turns out they were fake whales created by Industrial Light and Magic. Yeah, I do remember reading that they had robotic whales for the close-up scenes because people were complaining. They're like, ah, you can't be that close to whales. And they're like, ah, they're robots. I actually don't know if the robots are still in existence. I imagine they're probably sitting in some collector's vault somewhere. But I was quite surprised they were fake humpback whales. Because I've seen humpback whales in person and they looked very realistic. (laughs) <laughs> That's good that the real ones looked realistic. Well, of huh? course they did. Back when I worked on cruise ships, I was in Juneau, Alaska, and I took a whale watching tour to go see the humpback whales. And let me tell you, those things are big. <laughs> really big. I mean, I'm a gigantic six foot five, and I felt like a tiny little flea. We were on these boats. Prob- these boats were probably slightly larger than 20 foot pontoons. And we're looking and we're looking and I see a little spout of water come up. And they're like, oh, there's a humpback over there. And I'm looking and it's probably 40 feet away from me, the first one. Yeah. And when it breached, when it came up out of the water and then went back into the water, it created a wake that rocked our boat. And that thing was huge. All of a sudden you realize <laughs> that if it wanted to kill you, you were dead no matter what you did. <laughs> I know humpback whales are peaceful and they're vegetarians, but at the time, just the Size of load was like, wow. It was awe-inspiring. I was like, holy cow. And my immediate thought was the line from Jaws. I was like, <laughs> we're going to need a bigger boat. Put us back on the big boat, the cruise ship. Come on. Exactly. And then we saw another one that breached, and he was a little bit closer, but I was a little more used to it by then. But man, those things are huge. Uh, I don't know how they fit that inside of a Klingon cruiser. Fit two of those. <laughs> Also, what exactly was going to happen to the humpbacks once they get them to the 23rd century? Uh, They let them loose into the nice clean oceans that they have because we got rid of poverty and war and pollution and all the bad things on Earth. But there's just two of them. Oh, they were going to repopulate the species. That's what they kept saying. Were they going to clone them? or (laughs) Transporter clones. Because Star Trek taught us that you can't just repopulate a species with one male and one female of anything, more or less. No, I think in, according to Star Trek, it was closer to like 20,000. Uh, See, I thought I was like at least 40 couples, something. The genetic diversity was not high enough if you just, if you kept inbreeding, inbreeding, inbreeding. There's only two humpback whales. <laughs> yeah, they're doomed again, but <laughs> they made for a happy story if you don't think about that. Come on. That's right. To be fair, cloning technology in the 23rd century is probably good enough that they were able to save them. They would probably take genetic material, come up with clones that would be safe in the genetic pool, maybe. Maybe, but there was a Next Generation episode where they were cloning and the clones were degrading. It's true, but they were trying to clone humanoids. I would have... True. I would guess that a whale is easier to clone. Maybe not. Well, they did clone that sheep very successfully and a few others. That's right. We're already doing that in the 21st century. So who knows? I would say, and this just occurred to me now, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, is kind of the summer break of Star Trek movies. If you think back to when you were a kid, if you were fortunate enough to have summer break like we do in the U.S., where you did not have to go to school during the summer, if you were fortunate enough to have a home life where you got to do fun things in the summer, um, summer break was the greatest thing ever. And it was kind of a period where you got to live outside of normal time and just do fun things. Ah, the good times. I kind of think that's what Star Trek Four is as far as the original Star Trek movies go. It's the summer break movie. I think we need summer break in adult life too. A couple months off every year, that'd be good. That's the reason a lot of people become teachers. Mm. Shout out to our sister-in-law, Alicia. Of course, I think she's doing a master's degree now, so she probably won't get a summer vacation, or maybe she will. (laughs) That's right. She's also a grad student on top of being a teacher. That's not how you do it. (laughs) Unless you want to get ahead, which obviously she does, so it's a smart thing. But 
So that's my thought on Star Trek for the voyage home is it is the summer break of Star Trek films. If you're not familiar with Star Trek and you were to just watch Star Trek 4, I don't know that it would be as fun for you because in order for someone to break the norms of a character, you uh-huh. first have to understand the norms of the character. You can't take a crotchety, angry character and have them do something fun and have it be out of character if you don't already know that the character's crotchety to begin with. See, and here I was going to say it'd be more accessible for people who weren't normal watchers, but I didn't really think about that effect because you're absolutely right. If you don't know the characters, some of the jokes don't hit. You're like, oh, what a fun bunch of people, (laughs) which they are in Star Trek 4. But I would, if I was going back to watch one of the original Star Trek movies, or I should say the original cast in the Star Trek movie, I would start with Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan. How about you? Yep. That, that is an excellent place to start. And then, and not, not just because they go, <laughs> no, it's genuinely a good movie. It really is. It's fantastic. Star Trek one is awful, abysmal, terrible. Don't ever watch it unless you want to sleep. Or gain insights to the names and basic plot lines of some characters from TNG, which they ripped directly from Star Trek The Motion Picture. That's correct. But they really turned it around for Star Trek 2. Because what happened is Star Wars came out, and all of a sudden, all the film companies went, wait, space, (laughs) future, do we have anything space and future? They went, well, we have that that show that was on for three seasons in the 60s called Star Trek. We We could do a movie or something. They're like, yeah, let's do it. And then for some reason, they spent the whole movie flying around different things going, look at the special effects. You love the special effects. Hey, they were good. They were. For the time. <laughs> but, but now we live in an age where everyone has the greatest special effects ever, or somewhat, where it can all be computer generated. And if you go back and watch a shot, a 10 minute shot of flying around the ship going, look, it's a ship and it actually looks like it's floating. No one, no one now is going to go, oh my gosh, it looks like it's floating in space. Well, come on. At that point, it had been, what, 15, 20 years since they had seen Star Trek and they're like, hey, look what we can do with the Enterprise now. Yeah, but it had been only been a few years since they saw Star Wars where the ships were zooming in and blowing things up and that's what people wanted. And then they got... Hours and hours of look at the slow shot of the special effects. Come on, man. It's hard to get that camera to pan around that tiny little Enterprise model. Behold our glory. <laughs> look at the special effects. I would start with Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and then I would skip ahead to Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Yep. After that, I believe it was No Country for Old Men. <laughs> or something like that. Undiscovered Country. After that, we went to the final frontier where we meet Spock's brother and they break the barrier of the galaxy to find God. What need has God of a starship? (laughs) That's the one. Then you're right. Then we move on to the undiscovered country. Which is the one that has the really bad CG blood? (laughs) Where it's computer generated blood. It looks like the fakiest fake thing ever. But a lot of people say that's the one to watch. Two, four, and six. So you heard it here, not first. (laughs) Sadly, no. Watch the even-numbered Star Trek movies if you're going to go back and uh, check them out. So to sum it up, I think Star Trek IV is a really great example of fun science fiction. It's a really great look at the original Star Trek actors in something that is light and funny. And if you've only seen them in the original series, uh, a lot of times they had really heavy themes on that. I mean, yes, they had phasers and tribbles and whatnot, but for the most part, there was a lot of screaming and yelling and uh, themes of life and death and immortality. And yeah, it got really heavy. But Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, is a really great example of fun sci fi. It's light, it's fun, it's accessible. And I definitely give it five stars. Yep. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's worth the time. Well, we hope you all had a fun time hanging out with us today on Super Sci-Fi Party. If you'd like to tell us what you think about Star Trek 4, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or send us an email at party at super sci-fi party.com. We'd be more than happy to hear from you. Remember, you can also learn more about the show by visiting our website, at supersci-fi party.com. 
If you enjoy Super Sci-Fi Party, please pass it along to your awesome sci-fi loving friends. We need your help to spread the word about fun science fiction. Until next time for a Super Sci-Fi Party, I'm Todd Kinsley. And I'm Scott Kinsley. And in the immortal words of Doc Brown from Back to the Future, the future is what you make it. So make it a good one. Fare thee well, everyone. See ya. Watch where you're going, dumbass. And Kirk looks at him and goes, Double dumbass on you.